Lord God, the Father, just ask you to bless now, Lord God. Be with us in this time, Lord, this new location. Lord, I pray that people coming by, people jogging by or walking by, Lord, be interested. Lord God, as the other place, but this place cleaner and we're allowed to be here. And Lord, lift out your word, Lord. It's been such a long time. Lord, help us and grow us. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. All right, the Gospel of John. Yep. And well, since it's been such a while, we'll start in verse 1, reading. John 1 1. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice the capital W's. Now, in the Bible, I don't know if I said this before, if you see a normal word, like when we're going through Exodus now, if an angel, it has a capital A. That's God. Mm -hmm. When you see the word wonderful in Isaiah with capital W, that's God. So that word is God incarnate. That's Jesus Christ. So look for those words. You're, you're reading along and you see, well, why is that capitalized? It shouldn't be capital. It's not grammar. That's not proper grammar. It's Jesus, God. The same was with the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He, in him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Notice that capital L. Light. Jesus. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light. Capital L. But was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. And they still don't know who he is. Go witnessing, go any public ministry, and you'll find out the world does not love Jesus. You'll find quite opposite. And when somebody tells you, because all the stuff we get, all the nonsense that people come to us, oh, everybody just loves Jesus. No. You know what? You just tell me you don't witness. They don't. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and, he, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not, Jewish. But as many as received him, here's where we left off, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Amen. That's us, which were born not of blood. Now, I was born of a female mother. And I guarantee I wasn't there, but there was a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about the physical birth, nor the will of the flesh. When I got saved, I was not seeking God. I was trying to find a, I was at a I was at a a store where I was trying to shop for a God that enjoyed what I enjoyed. I wasn't looking for the holy God. Nor the will of man. Man will have you join the church. Man will have you do something. Man will have you, you know, here's my one eight hundred number. <laughs> Call and send me your prayers and your money, and I'll throw the prayers out. But of God. <clears throat> and we've been looking at through this study here, we've been looking at the Christian. We've been looking at, since it started, to him that received him. We looked at the sons of God. We looked at the believing on him. We looked at uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It takes belief in God. So, looking at the Christian family, looking at the sons of God, we moved to today, which we started the last study, about the church, and we're going to look at more of the church, but right now we're going to look at the church is not a building. Amen. Go to church. If somebody come up here right now and walk through this right now and say, well, I want you to come to my church. Well, excuse me, we're the church. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Amen. And their attitude would be, by their response that we would give them to that fact is, well, Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the Bible. I mean, can I sit down and join you? Okay, amen. We're dealing with a Christian. Well, no. See, you have to be in my church. You've got to have stained glass windows. You've got to have pews. You've got to have... You haven't read your Bible. You haven't studied your Bible. And the fact is, okay, if you have a Baptist church, if you got a Catholic church, if you got a Protestant church, you have a church, and listen, in the Catholic church, there are saved people. 
the rapture happens during church time, there will be people in the Catholic Church that will go up. And Baptist Church, Lutheran, and there are saved people in churches. And there are people who are going to be left behind. I think a lot of your Baptist churches, you're going to find Baptist churches going to get out, they're going to go to the, to the restaurant at noon, and they're going to find some of our friends. The way things are going today. But that's the way with all the See that, and people think, go to church, go to church, go to church. Well, not everybody has a building to meet. And when you read the life of Richard Rombard, his church was in a prison. And his message would be, they would tap messages on the walls. He had a garment that was all ripped and soiled and all that. And if you were to walk into a Baptist church today, they would look at it like, ew. Because we do not know what the true meaning of the church is. When the rapture, we speak about the rapture, we just got a track the other day for our table. What is the rapture? I finally realized there are probably Christians out there who don't even know what the rapture is. When God calls that trumpet and says, come up hither, wood, nail, hay, stone, and all that, ain't going. People, souls. Christ did not die for a brick. And when you look at brick in the first place in, in the book of Genesis, is they're gathering, they're making their own brick. Brick is man-made. And they're trying to build themselves a tower. To reach to God. Police. So, let's look at church. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And now when we go into Corinthians 14, especially 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians they, they got right. When you look at 1 Corinthians, it's a carnal church. It is your church of the lad to see in church age. They have, Paul is my favorite preacher. They have Apollos.com. Well, they've got Timothy.org. We've got the best soup kitchen. Nonsense. So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. He that speaketh, he that speaketh in an unknown tone edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. What is your language going to do to a building? Will the back wall of the church say, excuse me, I didn't understand that. Can you repeat that and take a note? And you say, well, this is kind of an odd verse to pick out. Well, it is. Only people who are not fit in their mind, I'm not making fun of them, will talk to a wall. Though there are some people when you do a public ministry, it's like you're talking to a wall. Especially more so for Christians. And in verse 12, the same chapter, 14, 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye, might, that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You know what the modern edifying of the church would be today? You don't want me to say this, do you? We gotta build a beautiful multi-million dollar building. I know. We gotta have the right seats. We gotta have the right drum set. We gotta have the right old tea. We walked into church one time and I told Tracy, I said, I wanted to go see this path. The guy is born. But he's a real good pre well, was a real good preacher. We walked in that church, it was like a mausoleum. Wow. They had people that would guide us. They had their own little coffee shop. I, walked, I went into the bathroom, and the bathroom was like, I was waiting for these little drawers to pull out dead bodies. Mm. And it's like, that's ridiculous. But edifying. What is edifying? Sitting here, cold, in Florida, at 10 a.m. with our Bibles open at a picnic table with no walls. And we're learning about the Bible. Right now, do you realize, okay, I'm going to say not today because I don't know. But I, I can say this way. Do you realize somewhere in a grassy area like this in China, they're meeting with the Bible and they're not supposed to by law? They can't meet in a building because it's illegal. 
There are places in the world today if they gather together, especially in Muslim countries. You cannot say in a Muslim, oh, come to church. That's right, they'll shoot you. Well, see, we got the mindset, okay? It's a building. And then when you do get a church, and certain people, as I was telling someone today about William and Claire Booth, they brought these, these prostitutes, they brought these homeless people, they brought these bumps into the Church of England, and they're like, ew. You're not allowed to bring them here. So they went off and started their own church. And they would meet in the park at gazebos and play the band, play Christian music, and they would preach on the green. This is the history of England, and this is the history of New England. And that's why I took Tracy to all the places of the greens in New England. There had been preaching, there had been gospel hymns sung, and there had been persecution of Christians. And edifying the church is people helping us to grow. I edify one man Friday at the, at the flea market in the Bible. We edify here Wednesday morning. Somebody can call me on the phone. Somebody can come up to me Friday, Saturday, and I'm preaching. They got questions. That's edifying. There's one guy who's a Christian. He's, he says he's saved. I have no reason to doubt. And he says, you know what? You, you encourage me by being here. And that guy's been encouraging me to me, edifying me, because I'm like, can they hear me? What's going on? Everybody's against God, and he'll come up and encourage me. Edifying is you help to grow, you don't put down. Again, we're looking at these verses. It's not a building. It is to edify, to teach, to instruct. Verse 23 of the same chapter. Now, imagine this, okay? Let's think the building. Ready? If therefore the whole church come together, how can you do that? How can you bring every building together? That's not it, see? How about get all the, all the people together into one place? <laughs> Put your church buildings in one place. Impossible. And all speak with tongues. Again, the church does not have a language to build it. <laughs> the church building has not a language. The people do. And there come in those that are unlearned and unbelievers. <gasps> Paul says that there are people that come into the church. Into the church, they're unbelievers, they're unlearned. They're not in the church, they're, they're visitors to the church. And what do they need? They need to be taught, they need to be edified, they need to be instructed. So, again, I, I take the fact, fact is, the church are people. And you have unbelievers, and you have unlearned. Unbelievers need to come to Christ. The unlearned need to be learned. They need to be taught. Do you like, we had a guy, yes, my wife, I don't know if she was there that day. We have a guy from, from Southern Baptist Church tell me, and he, he's well instructed in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday morning, all they do is get a gospel message for lost people. Every Sunday morning. And he told me they don't grow. They don't grow. Out of his own mouth, and he's a deacon of that church. I'm not going to give names or, or oh, anything like that. That's, they're still unlearned. Oh, they know how to be saved. But once you get saved, the Bible speaks of, when you're saved, you're a newborn babe. We, we all don't stay babes anymore. If you do, no, no disrespect, you are retarded. Okay? There's something physically wrong with you if you can't grow. That's not your fault. But if you are a Christian and you are retarded and you have not grown, there's a fault somewhere. A, you're not studying your Bible. B, you're not reading your Bible. C, you're not praying to the Bible. And D, you're in the wrong body of believers. And with the nonsense that's being preached and being taught in, in the, uh, uh, the pulpits today, imagine getting up and lying and ha, 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 ha. Imagine getting caught and saying, you know, we're going to have a, a pledge and not tell you what a pledge is. Uh, we're going to get up and we're going to speak about the three wise men that came to Jesus. Our children are going to put a little pageant Christmas for, thing for the people. Christmas is not in the Bible. It's not a three, three wise men. It's not in the Bible. Pledges are not in the Bible. There's a lot of things that are going on in today's churches and they're not in the Bible. And there are some things that are not in the Bible that are right. 
Sunday, nothing's wrong with Sunday school, but you can't find it in the Bible. But there are other things that the Bible despises. Galatians 1.13. Church epistles we're looking at. Galatians 1.13. Grandpa eats popcorn. Galatians 1.13. The guy that witnessed to me, thank God he did, with a King James Bible, thank God he did, that was there to show me how to be led to Christ, thank God he did, stood at my brother's memorial service and talked about baseball and fooling around, and when I gave them that church that he belonged to, that he didn't go to, when I gave them a video, say, listen, I can't be there, in whatever circumstance I can't be there, will you play it? They would not play that video before the people because it spoke more about Jesus than it did about my brother. And the pastor told, told my aunt to tell me that, well, it was X amount of minutes. X amount of minutes about Jesus and X amount of minutes about your brother. I gave a little thing about salvation. That was it. Okay? You mean you weren't happy that the name of Jesus was praised? You weren't happy? The fact is, we didn't worship the man? No, I worship the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. So Galatians 1.13. So Christ is not even... He's being moved out of the church according to Revelation chapter 3. You know he's standing outside the church knocking. Mm -hmm. He won't even go in. He won't go into the foyer. He won't go into the vestibule. He won't go into the lobby. He's standing on the door knocking. Galatians 1.13 For ye have heard of my conversation. That, that doesn't mean talking. That means conduct. Here. In times past in the Jews' religion, how that ye, beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Notice religion, and then notice church. Now we're looking at the body of believers. You got your religion, I got mine. Absolutely not. I don't have a religion. I'm sorry. I have a Savior. Oh, I got Jesus too. Is yours a biblical Jesus? Because Paul tells us there's another Jesus. Now, when Paul says it persecuted the church, it's not like he's taking sledgehammers. He's not getting a wrecking ball. He is killing. He is torturing. He's imprisoning. He's putting them in bondage. People. The church has been persecuted and is persecuted today in other places in the world. Today. In 2019, there are Christians persecuted. And Muslim nations, and African nations. We know a missionary in, in Africa where they say if they get saved, they're ostracized from their family. Get out of here. You're can't, gone. Can't we don't know job, you. Mm. So when the church sold their goods in the book of Acts, it wasn't for a building program. It was for Jewish people can't make a living in Jerusalem no more. So we've got to help them and move them somewhere where they can get it. We've got to give them aid. So Ephesians 5.24. Ephesians 5.24. Now, you can't miss this one. Amongst the sexual perversion of a man and man can get married, and a woman and a woman can get married, which very soon you're going to be able to have people, and it's happening today in the world. People are going to be are marrying their pets. Okay? They're doing it. I've never heard of that yet. That's, I, I believe that's England. It's actually, are you serious? It's actually in what we read not too long ago about... I think it was in Leviticus, yeah. that why they had to get them out of Egypt, because yeah. of the abominations, they were man with animal. Yep. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So it's been going on so, uh, longer than we think. And the thing is, I'm, I, I, I shouldn't be thinking, relying on all this, but this is what's happened. When you make fun of marriage, mm -hmm. well, let's look at what we're reading right now. Galatians 5.24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives 
be to their own husbands in everything. What's a wife? What's a husband? They're people. And the relationship of a wife to her husband is a relationship of the church to Jesus. The wife is to be in submission to the husband. And boy, is that watered down today. Or that's not even spoken about because that's against now. Against women. Against equal rights. We're supposed to be listening to Christ as a wife is supposed to be listening to the husband. Again, we're looking at, I'm looking at the fact that it's not a place, it's a person. So the thing is, every, well, Sunday, go to church. What if there are no gathering of people where you are? I don't think there's probably a lot of congregation if a Christian ends up in Antarctica or some jungle somewhere or Alaska or something. Yeah, he was thinking about relocating us to Alaska about two years ago. Who was? Because there's, there's, no, there's not any. There's one man up there I know teaching on Alaska. But if... In our church, we have, there's a map of where churches are, and there's a big hole in, this, in the middle of America, North America. But today, I was talking to a guy the other day, I said, what I want to do if we ever get a church going here, I want to I practically have services seven days a week. Because not everybody can make it. Because there are people working Sunday morning, and they've got to work to survive. We live, we don't live in a Sabbath area. We are America, seven days, 24 hours. And people can't make it. the Bible says you've got to work. And if their employer will not, not every employer is like Chick-fil-A or, or uh, Hobby Lobby. So you've got to offer to people, you've got to step out and you've got to help the Christians by different times. But... There may be a time when a Christian will have, okay, I go to this church Sunday morning, I can make that time. But I can't make their midweek service because i got to work, but that midweek service, I can go, I'm off. And then churches will be, well, now here we go, now this is the problem. You went to that church? You didn't come here? I thought we were all body of belief. If we're all sent around the King James Bible... And we love the Lord and we want to learn, but our time schedule of our employment or thing I'm not talking about, you know, you got little league or anything like that. We're not looking at that. We're looking at our time schedule for working. It's not the same. And if, if Satan really loves the fact is he would keep a good man out of church learning, would not Satan say, ha, 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 you make it work on Sundays. Then what do you do? Offer him another time. Yeah, the Bible says, I had to rebuke my son, the Bible does say in the book of Acts, the first day of the week. They met on the first day of the week. It didn't say just Sunday morning. Paul, one time, he's preaching in the middle of the night, a guy falls out a window. And see, we've got this thing too. Okay, church service ends at noon. A lot of them good, because a lot of them boring, stupid, they need to end at noon. But when you got the Holy Spirit working... And you're going. We restricted God in the church. I mean, I teach my family every night the Bible. That's church. Husbands and fathers have not realized, oh, we go to church. Sir, church is right there in your living room. But, but no, wait a minute. What is, what is the review? Oh, they got a living, living room religion. You're going against the family. Because the, because the Bible says for the wife, she says, you got a question? You go to your husband. Where two or three to get. And then we just say, as a wife, there's a church. But we're not supposed to forsake the assembly. We're not supposed to forsake the assembly. Amen. We're supposed to seek Christian guidance, Christian help. But when we make the church the God, the idol. Remember, in the Laodicean church age, Jesus Christ is standing outside the church. And I see what? Uh, verse 27, same chapter, Ephesians 5, 27. I'm not against the church. I think a true church needs to get right with God and need to 
for other for the people. That he may present it present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what God expects of us, and we're just sinners. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us. But when you allow the world in, when, when you have what the Bible said, you know, the, the, the works of the heathen, you put a tree, a Christmas tree, and then you defend it. I mean, what are you going to do? Then you're not cleansing. You're not getting right. Now, let's look at the meetings. Romans 16, 5. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. Now, remember, as we're reading Paul and Peter, they're under the emperor Nero. You are not going to meet in a public place under Nero. Because Nero will grab you. And the Bible, I mean, the history tells you that Nero would grab Christians, he would stick them on a stick, he would put you in tar, and he would let you on fire, and he would have a garden party and say, look people, here's the light of Jesus upon our party. Isn't it so great we have elimination? And then some idiot will come up to you, well, I let my light shine. You don't even know what you're saying. You don't even know what you're saying. You haven't studied Bible, never mind history. So Romans 16, verse 5. You know what's missing in the church today? It's missing history. It's missing Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's missing Pilgrim's Progress. 16.5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. The book of Romans, the book of Acts, speak about churches were in people's houses. Where have we gone from that? Big, big, great dead buildings. You know, they were... And that was a lot for the wife. Did we just read something about the wife? The house has to be cleaned up. Chairs had to be set up. And then when everybody leaves, I, I don't know how many would help to clean up and stuff like that. But that, that was a heavy burden. And yet the fellowship together in their house. You didn't have to go 20 miles. I, I talked to a missionary in Ethiopia. They would travel two days to get to church. And they would eat grass on the way because there was no food and all that. And it's in the area of persecution. You don't even get Christians in America with cars and automobiles to go far for the church. But here it is. It's in the neighborhood. Well, I'm trying to say it's in the neighborhood. Here's a church. 1 Corinthians, again, 16, 19. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. So what you would do is, as a Christian, you would open your home to the Lord and to the people. That took a, that took a lot. That's not giving a, just a tithe or an offering. That's giving something. That's what Louise offered today. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you told him? 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that's in their house. Aquila and Priscilla had a house church. We've met Bible students and Bible graduates who defamed the house church. Now listen, let, let me settle down too. You do not have a Bible study. This is how you not do it. All right? We're good. Okay, we just read passage, verse 19. Well, Louise, how do you feel about that passage? Well, that sounds good. Oh, Rachel, how do you feel? That's not Bible study. Mm -hmm. Bible study is when you have a man who has been called by God with the authority of the Scriptures to teach. 
And, and if you have a question, you do not interrupt the service. You do not, to say, hey, I got a question. Sure, let's look at your question. Well, you see, my outline is scheduled for only 45 minutes. I can't go, you know, I can't extend <laughs> this message to the next week. I got to all get, no. Aren't we supposed to say teach, edify, grow, instruct? One guy asked me, he goes, well, what about somebody has a question? So we stop, we look at that question. If I'm able to answer it, I'll answer it. If I got to study, I'll bring the question up the next week with the answer. Man, if you raise your hand in a church, you're going to get some pastors upset. So then what happens is, let's say we're going through this message, and Tracy, you know, she's saying, and she gets confused on something. We go 45 minutes in a lesson, her mind has been boggled with, what did he say? What did that mean? And she didn't get the rest of the message. Whereas Tracy has something, she has a question, and she said, hey, listen, I got this question. Maybe someone else has that question, and they're afraid to ask. Do it all the time during our Bible study. You know? Yep. But there's a church in the house, Colossians 4.15. Colossians 4.15. Grandpa eats popcorn. <laughs> I always tell her, when I don't have a Bible with tags. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to get us off the stained glass, the, the altar, and all that. We had a guy one time at one of our Bible studies in a, in a dirty spot of Daytona Beach, knelt down right there on the pavement. Yeah, she was there. Yeah, I'm just saying, we had that guy knelt down on the pavement. You mean he didn't knelt down on an altar? You can't find altar for the church. Chapter 4, verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. Oh, Laodicea. There it is. What was the verse? Verse 15. Colossians 4, 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nephesus and the church which is in his house. There is again. There is again. Now how about this one? Philippians. I mean not Philippians. Philemon. Philemon 1, only Philemon, verse 2. Philemon 1, 2. Right before Hebrews, one book before Hebrews. Now, Philemon, the short book as it is, is a slave owner. <gasps> and he has slaves. <gasps> Let's see what Philemon does. Verse 2. And by the way, this happened down south. For many slaves, for their slave owners. Many did not do it. Alright? Philemon 2. And to our beloved Athea, and Archippus, great names, going through Chronicles, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Here is a church that's in a man who's a slave owner. And I guarantee, when you read the rest of the story, those slaves are also invited into his house. You have a runaway slave. But those slaves are invited into the house church to learn about Jesus Christ. That happened down south. I mean, they brought them into the big church buildings, but still, the slaves were given to the preaching. But here are the churches by them too. So, there's those meetings. Something homely about a house church. You're amongst more family, you know? All right. Let's see where we can get with this one. The first place church shows up in the Bible. Matthew 16, 8. Matthew chapter 16, verse 8.
And Matthew, you've got to be careful because Matthew is a Jewish book, but church, it says church. Again, it's not a building. And I would think that some artist has probably tried to paint this as a building. You're wrong. Matthew 16, 18, and I say, on, I say also unto thee, this is red letter in my Bible, it means it's Jesus, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, who Jesus say in hell, hell shall not prevail against it. All right, that's the first place church shows up in the Bible. Now we got a problem here. I don't know if you knew about the problem. I am a born again Bible believing Christian. I am in the body of Christ. We we studied through that last. I am a son of God by Jesus Christ. That's me. Upon a rock, upon the rock. I am built upon my foundation according to the Romans and Corinthians is is upon Jesus Christ. Now Thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Let me show you an illustration. Here's Jesus. He's talking to Peter. And he says, upon this rock. He's pointing to himself. Okay? Peter, upon this rock. Me, on the rock. Corinthians, Paul writes, says that rock was Jesus. That him says, that rock is Jesus. But when you got the Catholic Church... We're going to get to church, you know, big building, stained glass, altars, and, ooh, holy, and closets you walk in and talk to people. The Catholic Church will read like this. I, I say it to you that thou art Peter, you, upon this rock. Peter, I will build my church, the Catholic Church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever seen the flag of, of the Vatican? There's two keys, skeleton keys, of all keys to be used. Well, guess who they say that is? That's Peter holding the keys of death and hell. That Peter isn't the joke. Peter stands at the, or sits at the pearly gate and you have to go through him. That's a lie. The keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth. Okay, but we're looking at that rock. And we're looking at the foundation of the church and what is that rock that is the foundation of us? Let's take our Bibles to the rock, Psalms 118.29. Psalms 118.29. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a church in a building. Just don't worship the building. Look to the people. Psalms 118. Oh, Psalms 118, verse 22. Psalms 118, 22. Now, this is prophecy, and this is spoken about in the Gospels. Psalms 118.22. We'll be coming back to Psalms. It says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. It's a mar Here's this stone that they say, Get rid of that. We don't want that. We don't want that stone. But then again, wow, look how great that stone is. Mark 12.10. Mark chapter 12, verse 10. And we're looking upon Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verse 10. Words of red, Jesus Christ. I don't know your Bible. Mine has the red. 
Have you not read this scripture? Have you not read the scripture? The stone which, we just read that. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is what the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. And the whole parable that he spoke about, the previous, we're not going to look at it all, it's about Jesus. 1 Peter 2.7. 1 Peter 2.7. You know why, oh, I'm in James. You know why you can say, these things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life, you can't lose it? Who are you built upon? You're built upon God. And don't you see the wrong with an error when it says Jesus is not God? If he's just an ordinary man, let's say Jesus was not God, an ordinary man like me. I forget things. I forget where I put things. And if Jesus was an ordinary man, he might forget to put where he put me. Then I would be lost. But since he's God, he knows all, he has all the power of knowing. Guess what? Can't lose me. 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Is he precious to you? But unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. The same is made the head of the corner. Oh, look at it. Peter explaining Psalms and Mark. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word, word being disobedient whereunto they are also, where they are where they were appointed. When I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are people who love the Lord and, wow, that is a good message. That is good what you're doing. I am so glad you're doing it. I wish I could do that. And then when you get people, when I preach the gospel of Jesus, the same gospel, oh, shut up, get out of here, get out. Uh. And they trip and fall into hell forever because they're disobedient. And what? The word. The same rock that one man says, hey, I am so glad you preached Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Thank you very much. To him, that stone, that, that man that says, I hate you, get out of here. We're going to do everything we can do to stop you. To that stone, they reject that one that the man loves Jesus. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Imagine one stone, the Bible says, that is able to be loved and cherished and then Again, it could be hated and despised. Is that not our Lord Jesus Christ? Acts chapter 4, 11. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. And we'll start in verse 10. See what the Lord give us time. Because this is a great study about the rock. There's a hymn. I haven't heard in a long time. That rock is Jesus. That rock is... I forget. Forgetting the old hymns. Your anchor holds. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. Well, verse 10 I said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, okay, now we know what we're talking about, whom ye crucified, whom God has raised from the dead. Look at the, look at the gospel there. Death, burial, and resurrection. Even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set at naught of you, builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now there's no beyond a shadow of doubt who we're talking about that that stone, that rock of offense. Upon this rock, it's Jesus Christ. One more place for that, Romans chapter 9, 33. Jesus Christ is spoken of as a stone of stumbling, the stone that people don't want. Yet, a precious stone. They say diamonds are a girl's best friend. No, it better be Jesus. 
and you're not going to wrap him around your finger. Diamonds, uh, old coal or something like that, compressed. Romans chapter 9, verse 33. As is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. People trip over Jesus and end up in hell. A rock of offense. I preach the gospel and see how much offensive it comes. Hand somebody a gospel tract. See how they will hate you. Tell them their church is wrong and see how loving they will be to you. Tell them, I am not going to worship your pastor. I'm going to worship Jesus and see how you are hated. Kick Santa Claus in the butt and see how they will hate you. And whosoever believeth on him, now doesn't that match John chapter 1? shall not be ashamed. Those that trip over him, those that fail at him, are going to be made ashamed. Back to Psalm 78, 35. Psalm 78, 35. And what we just did, we ran the whole course of Psalms 118 through the Bible. Psalm 78, 35. God is so good. Amen. Now, before we get into uh, this, this came to my head. And better, I realize when I come things in my, my head, I better get them out before I lose it. You know, you can have the rock that's Jesus, or you can have the rock and roll. You know where, you know where Lucifer was before he fell? He was a musical choir director in heaven. And you ever know most churches fail is in the music department. Many stories of pastors that I've heard of somebody trained off with a piano player. It's quite interesting. I just have to throw that out there. So, Psalms 78, 35. And they remembered that God was their rock. God was their rock. Who was that rock we just ran the last cross for us to Jesus. Jesus. Jehovah Witness wouldn't believe that. God was their rock. And the high God, their Redeemer. Well, who purchased and who died for our sins? Jesus. That's an anti-Jehovah Witness passage there. When you run the previous passages. Now with that verse, Deuteronomy 32, 15. Again, yeah, we're just scripture with scripture. I am not giving you no... What I think. I don't care. You could, shouldn't care what I think. And if it is what I think, I'll tell you what, what I think, and you can drop what I think. <laughs> but what the Bible says, I advise you not to drop. At any point, you think, well, you know what? That verse does not go with what. Tell me, because I can be wrong. I may made a mistake. I may wrote down the wrong verse. That's more like, or read the verse wrong because my handwriting is horrible. But pretty much, have you not seen that all these verses work together as one? And that's what the Bible says, study. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But Jeshua, that's a poetic name, another name for Israel, wax fat. All right, you got fat, you got... And kicked, rebellion. Thou art waxen fat and art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. <laughs> Sometimes being fat ain't good. <laughs> then he forsook God, which made him, not evolution. Didn't we read about John chapter 1, about God creating all things in the Word? Well, there's Jesus. There he is again. There's another anti-Jehovah Witness scripture. Because what we read in John chapter 1 and study is Jesus Christ. There it is. They forsook God, which made him. John chapter 1. So look how all this is going into our study of John. We're not going out on a rabbit trail. We're staying within John. And highly esteemed, I mean, excuse me, lightly esteemed, the rock, capital R, remember I just told you about the capitals, that's God of his salvation. 
All right, so what is his salvation? Does anybody know what Jesus means? Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. There it is. So biblically today, looking at the rock, we are shooting down the Catholic Church and we've already banged up the Jehovah Witnesses. Exodus 17, 6. I think we can get these done. Exodus 17, 6. I mean, I'd rather be standing on a rock than shifting sand. And that was a parable that Jesus gave. There's a man that, with the word of God, he built upon a rock. And the storms came, and the wind blew, and that, hot, that rock stayed. That house stayed. But the man that built it on shifting sand, utter destruction. Exodus 17, verse 6. Behold, I stand before thee upon the rock of Horeb. In the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. Do you know somebody who was smitten? And there shall come water out of the rock, out of it. Do you know somebody who said, I am the water of life? Jesus. That the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Well, there is that familiar story of the water that came from the rock. It should be a Sunday school lesson for, for kids, I hope. It should be, but probably not. Numbers 20, verse 8. Numbers 20, verse 8. That boring book of Numbers. It ain't, it ain't so boring. Numbers 20, verse 8. In Numbers 20, verse 8, take the rod. The Lord speaking to Moses. And gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. Speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. Thou shalt bring forth to him the water out of the rock, so that shall give the congregation their beast drink. Now notice the first time he read it, he says, smite the rock. God said this time, speak to it. Now Moses will smite the rock again and go and sin. You're not going to smite Jesus Christ the second, third, quadruple's time. He was only smitten once for our sins. You speak to Jesus the second. After you're saved and he's washed you and cleansed you, you speak to Jesus. You don't hit him. There's that rock. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15. By the time we get to the last verses, you'll definitely know it. We're talking about Jesus. Deuteronomy 8, 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, where there were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, when you strike a lighter, that stone that's in that lighter is flint. Flint is without water. It is a very dry rock. And that speaks about Isaiah 53. I, I believe it says something, I forget what it says now, but about dryness. You don't get water out of a rock. And yet when you run to Hebrews chapter 12, which we're not, it says our God's a consuming fire. Again, we're shooting down the Jehovah Witnesses. But when we get done with this whole study here, we'll shoot down the Catholics in their church. So that rock that came forth water is a rock of God. It's the rock of Jesus Christ. And it is a flint rock, according to Deuteronomy 8, 15. Deuteronomy 32, 11. 32, 11. Oh. No. 
could that be? Bad writing. Bad writing. Oh, uh, all right, we'll go to Nehemiah 9.15. That was a bad scribal error. I'm a sinner. Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah 9.15. Hope I didn't get this wrong. Here you just admit your sins, your faults, your errors, and just move on. I'm glad God never sins or errors. Amen. 9.15. I hope not. i got to turn the page again. Thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 915. Okay, thanks. Now, in Nehemiah 915, they're coming out of the Babylonian captivity. By the way, this is all history for the Jews. They ought to know the history. We ought to know the history. Nehemiah 915, and gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, John chapter 6. And brought it forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst. There's that rock again. And it's water. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the water of life. There it is. It's got to be Jesus. We'll, we'll keep reading. We'll keep studying. Psalms 114.8. And remember, we're going to study the show Jesus is the rock. We're going to, with this study, Psalms... 14a because the Catholic Church says that that rock is Peter have you seen Peter yet I haven't seen him so when the church is wrong against the Bible we need to show the truth of the Bible Psalms 114 verse 8 which turned the rock into a standing water the flint, remember we looked at that before, that flinty rock and the fountains of water. So it looks like that, that rock at one point became like a lake. And then at another point, when Moses was told to speak to that rock, it came out like a river, a fountain. That's great. Standing water stays, it don't move. A fountain, the water moves. So when we're looking at Jesus Christ, he is standing there before we're saved, like, hey, here I am. Want a drink? And when you receive that drink and you receive Christ, then he starts moving in your life. He ain't going to move in your life until you get that first drink of him. And then, oh, the refreshing he is. How wonderful. And look how that's laid out, standing. I mean, wouldn't you not look at Jesus who suffered and died on that cross? Would you not look at it on the cross as, in a way that he's standing there? So, last, well, then we go back to Matthew, but 1 Corinthians 10.4. 1 Corinthians 10.4. And the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10.4, And did all drink, that spiritual drink, well, they had physical water, H2O. But Paul's telling us that there was another form of water there. For they drank of that spiritual rock. They drank physical water and they drank from that rock. There's a rock. You could kick it. You could touch it. But here, a spiritual rock that was there that they did not see that followed them. And some believe that that rock followed the Israelites through the wilderness. And ready? And that rock was Christ. Is that plain and simple what we just read? So, back to Matthew 16, 18, to refute a church. Matthew 16, 18.
Again, in Matthew 16, 18, I have no problem with that being Jesus. And again, the red letter is Jesus speaking. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, okay? Upon this rock. Okay, Who, who's the reference? We went a wrong way to go to 1 Corinthians 10, 4. We could go and just write to 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and say, okay. But we had to look at that rock in the wilderness. We had to look at where that rock was, who that rock was. No water came out of Peter. Peter is not a flinty rock. Peter was not rejected. He was put in jail. He hung on the cross, they say, upside down. He's not God. He's not the salvation that we ran the cross references of. Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Who is that rock? That rock is the same rock that was in the wilderness of Israel. That gave them water. The same one that Jesus had a well, John chapter 4. Said, hey, I am the water of life. And upon that, the gates of hell shall not prevail again. Listen, hell is not going to overwhelm us that are saved. Hell is not going to conquer us, those that are saved. We may think at times, oh, we've been defeated, we're, we're in bad straits, but no, it, no, it's not. The church is not a building. It's an assembly. A church is to be likened as the wife to a husband. The church is to meet somewhere. The church are ha to have people gathered together. The church is supposed to edify and lift up and educate and instruct and guide Christians. The church is supposed to come out of the world. And that church is founded upon a rock one group of believers say that rock is Peter. Those who are Bible believers say that rock is Christ. And as we went through the studies of the rock, we see it's not the Jehovah Witnesses. So we blew away two churches. Well, I know Jehovah Witnesses don't say they're a church. And that's what the church is. It's a bunch of believers that are standing upon the rock of Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's our glory. And that's our foundation. Anything else, they built their, their foundation on shifting sands. And when they come to their end, they could be a great fall. Lord God, I just thank you for this time, Lord God. I pray, Lord, we'll be able to meet next time, Lord. Lord, that we all have fellowship together, Lord, in you. Lord, help us read our Bibles, help us to pray, and help us this week to come, Lord. Lord, this looks like many evangelistic activities this week, Lord God. I pray that you bless them all. Help us all, Lord God. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.